Greetings, everyone. I'm Mohammed Tabakuli, the inaugural director of the Elahe Omidyar Mirjalali Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto. I welcome you all to today's Zoroastrian Studies Seminar Series featuring Professor Sambra Azarnoush, who is speaking on Zoroastrian religion and natural disasters, the case of earthquakes in ancient Iran. The series is organized in collaboration with the Encyclopedia Ironica Foundation, the Federation of Zoroastrian Association of North America, the Zoroastrian Society of Ontario, and the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute. I would like to express my gratitude to the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute and Dr. Elahe Omidyare Mirjalali for their generous support of the Elahe Omidyare Mirjalali Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto. At the outset, I'd like to express our collective gratitude to Canada's Indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the Elahe Omidyare Mirjalali Institute of Iranian Studies operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Vandat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, and teach on their ancestral homeland. My colleague, Professor Miguel Andres Toledo, will introduce Professor Ozarnoush and will moderate today's session. Miguel. First of all, thank you very much and welcome to this online lecture. I will introduce Professor Sandra Azarnush. Professor Sandra Azarnush is Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the Ecole Pratique des Autitudes in Paris, where she teaches the history of pre-Islamic religions in Iran and ancient Iranian languages. She is also a member of the CNRS team Center the Centre de Recherche, de Recherche sur le Monde Iranien. Her research focuses on several aspects on Zoroastrianism, including textual sources and the scriptural tradition, religious mythology, and the political and social history of late antiquity. Her publications include a broad range of articles and book chapters, and a very interesting, I recommend it, a very interesting book, which is the annotated edition and translation of the Middle Persian text Husrav i Kavadam Ud Redake, which means literally Husro, the son of Kavak, and a page. It was published in 2013 in Peters. She has also edited several collected volumes, and she's currently finalizing the first complete edition, translation, and commentary of a very important and very difficult Pahlavi text, which is the Denkat IV, which sheds lights sorry, which sheds light on issues of intellectual transfer, patronage in the sciences, and ties between rulers and the clergy in the late Sassanian period. It is my great, my very great, great pleasure to introduce Samra Azarnush, and please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Miguel Angel. Uh, hello to everyone. It's a great privilege for me to, to be here today and I would like to thank uh, Miguel Angel, uh, Andres Toledo, Professor uh, Raffaelli and also Professor Tavakoli Targi for their very kind invitation. Um, I have to add that uh, I'm particularly happy to, to give this presentation for the Zoroastrian community of Toronto. I, am, um, I was a student of the Zoroastrian High School uh, in Tehran, the Anushiravan Dotgar High School. And many of my classmates emigrated to Toronto. And uh, so I, I, have, I still have a very deep attachment to, uh, to the Zoroastrians of this town. Uh, I'm also uh, particularly happy to have this session uh, held under the auspices of Elahe Omidyar Mirjaloli Institute of Iranian Studies. Um, um, especially because uh, we have a new center, a new uh, Elahe Omidyar uh, Mirjaloli Center d'études persanes at École Pratique des Hautes Études, EPHE. It is a new foundation, and I, um, uh, I guess it's the first 
uh, academic foundation in Europe, so that we are very uh, proud to have this center in Paris. And um, I'm also very proud to serve as a member of the scientific council in this uh, new center. And this will surely strengthen the ties between Paris and Toronto uh, in the most fertile way possible. Um, I, um, I want to um, speak about earthquake today. And uh, I guess this topic may be it may sound a little bit strange to some of you. Um, um, in this paper, I would like to shed light on the way the Zoroastrian beliefs address the natural phenomenon of earthquake. And well, we are living in a time of climate change and natural disaster, and these environmental issues affect us profoundly not only in our daily lives, but also in our relationship with the world and with nature. Our generation is therefore perhaps better able to understand the, the anxiety uh, felt by men in ancient times to in confrontation with destructive phenomena that deprive them of their sense of security. As you know, the modern world has never been able to offer a definitive solution to the problem of earthquakes. And seismic standards are rarely respected, even in areas most affected by earthquake. One of the peculiarities of earthquake is that their cause is invisible as it lies beneath the earth. Earthquakes have therefore been explained by the ancient people in the most var varied and imaginative ways. Another peculiarity of earthquake is that, as you all know, they occur along fault lines and a tremor is much, it's much more likely to happen where, where the earth has shaken before. So there is a kind of, let's say, the memory, a memory of the earth um, and it's very likely that the in inhabitants of these earthquakes prone zones have some of the most elaborate beliefs and myth about earthquakes. So uh, now, why is it important to speak about earthquakes in ancient times? This idea uh, came to me on February uh, the 6th, 2020. Three, when two devastating earthquakes struck Turkey and Syria. With over 50,000 victims and thousands of buildings destroyed, these were among the deadliest earthquakes of the 21st century. With a few colleagues at the École Pratique des Hautes Études, we decided to organize a charity day, um, including lectures on the beliefs about earthquakes in ancient times and in different religions, in partnership with an NGO that was at that time very active in Turkey and Syria and provided aid to uh, earthquake victims. Um, every region in, of the world uh, affected by earthquake has its own mythology and beliefs about this phenomenon. For instance, Japan, of course, India, Mesopotamia, Greece, Greece uh, the Pacific Island, and of course, Iran and its neighboring countries. These were the regions and the cultures that were discussed uh, during this uh, charity and scientific uh, day uh, session at EPHU. It was in this context of conflicting doctrines on earthquake that I realized that Zoroastrianism offered a highly original response and it, this deserve, um, I think, a separate study on the subject, despite the scarcity of sources available to us. Five days ago, a powerful earthquake struck Herat province in Afghanistan near the border with Iran, and a second one killed nearly 2,000 people the day before yesterday. It was one of the most destruct destructive quakes in the country's recent history, and it could happen ag again as uh, Herat is on a tectonic boundary between two plates and it form uh, a, a strike strip. 
In, uh, in this map, uh, further east, you can see the Iranian plateau. Not only this Iranian plateau is crisscrossed by numerous faults, it is also located on a subduction zone at the junction of the Arabian plate and the Eurasian plate. The Arabian plate po pushes the Iranian plate to the northeast, causing the Zagros chain to rise. Not surprisingly, earthquakes are extremely frequent in Iran. The deadliest earthquake ever, uh, ever recorded in Iran of magnitude 7.4 uh, happened on the 21st of June 1990 in the northwest between the provinces of Gilan and Zanjan, killing uh, 40,000 people and injuring 30,000. Half a million people were left homeless. It was one of the worst disasters in the country's history. The tremors were felt far away as Tehran, 300 kilometers from the epicenter, where millions of residents were awakened in the middle of the night by strong vibration. I myself remember very vividly uh, a deafening noise, um, a low frequency rumbling, uh, the panic that followed, and of course the concern about the consequences if an earthquake were to occur in the megalopolis of Tehran, which lies, as you can see in this slide, in a seismic zone on a large fault beneath the Alborz mountain. This, of course, has uh, really uh, 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 kind of the debate on the application of earthquake resistant standards, but without uh, any effects. Another much debated, uh, much talked about earthquake uh, was the one that devastated the historic city of Bam in southeastern Iran, killing around 40,000 people and destroying 700, uh, seven, uh, a per 70 percent um, of, of uh, buildings in the Kerman region, even though its magnitude was only uh, 6.4 on the Richter uh, scale. Uh, losses were also immense for the region's archaeological heritage, as the impact reduced the world's largest adobe complex, complex to rubble, the citadel of Bam, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has, of course, um, been restored to virtually uh, its original state. Um, looking back over the period from the 7th century uh, to the 13th century, the collection of earthquake data from historical sources reveals a high concentration along the Silk Road, uh, converging to Baghdad, uh, via Ray City to the north or via the Zagros to the south. The political, religious, and commercial importance of this road meant that almost everything that happened along it was recorded by the sources. Thus, um, all the results based on statistical evaluation are biased and therefore not entirely reliable for historians. Nevertheless, the towns of Ray and Neishabur seems to have been particularly hit by very destructive earthquakes uh, during their history. The earliest recorded uh, earthquake was in the region of Rai, uh, Raga, uh, in the fourth century BC, according to the Greek historiographer Duris of Samos, quoted by Strabo. Um, uh, who uh, tried to explain the, the, the name of the city by a Greek etymology um, because of its frequent earthquakes. Uh, this uh, data on, um, on the recurrence of earthquakes in urbanized areas already in ancient times highlight the context in which a set of beliefs and myth around this phenomenon may have emerged. It is not hard to imagine that these beliefs may have spread through commercial routes, such as the roads that crosses the towns of Ray. Some of these beliefs, uh, beliefs stem 
from a system of thought of a Zoroastrian religion. Zoroastrian data on earthquakes are not numerous, and the sources are mostly the Pahlavi books. Um, so there are, there are very few, but they are to me quite important for two reasons. The earthquake is considered a cosmogonic phenomenon as it is granted a special role in the story of the world beginning. And secondly, the Zoroastrian authors of the ninth century had reflected on this phenomenon, attempting to give it both a mythical and a rational explanation as we shall see in a moment. Um, there are uh, at least uh, four Middle Persian texts that uh, mention earthquake, but in this talk, I will focus only on two of them, the Bundahish and the Dadastan the Denig. Uh, we know from these Middle Persian texts that uh, Magi have given thought to the phenomenon of, of earthquakes, and like any true scholar, have tried to understand the inex inexplicable. Um, they have tried to peer into the invisible and to find a reason for the disaster they had caused. Uh, we can divide um, our data on earthquake into two different parts. The first is the cosmogonic narrative, according to which the earthquake is a phenomenon that takes place into, in the mechanism that sets the world into motion. This episode is uh, very well known to, I guess, most of you, and it has been studied a great deal because it also explains the appearance, uh, the, the, the rise of mountains. It has also been much studied by colleagues interested in apocalyptic schemes, uh, according to which the mountains that appeared at the beginning of the creation will become flat again at the end of the time, at the time of the fresh year. According to this account that I'm sure you, you know well, um, there has been an intrusion, an uh, attack of evil, of Ahriman, into the realm of the good, into the realm of Ormazd. And this intrusion has plunged the world into the state of mixture. Ahriman's rushing into the world of light shook the earth and it began, the earth began to shake. As a response to this intrusion, each of Orma's six primary creatures, sky, water, and so on, fight back in their own way uh, against the attack of evil in an attempt to reduce its destructive action and to resist, to resist its grasp. The Earth response to this attack is particularly interesting. The earthquake caused by Ahriman awakened the germ of the mountains in the heart of the earth, which set in motion the growth of the mythical mountain, the Haribors or Arbors, all around the earth. And from the root of Haribors or Arbors, all the other mountain of the world grew. The root of all mountains are woven together to form an immense underground network which would protect the Earth's surface from earthquake damage. Mountains are compared in this text to trees, living creatures interconnected by their roots in uh, the hidden areas of the Earth. In this cosmogonic uh, sequence, there are two mythical elements that I find very striking. The first is the alternation between the act of destruction, that is uh, uh, the earthquake caused by evil, and the act of reconstruction carried out by creatures of the good, the earth that generate the mountains. A second interesting feature is the transition between a single being to multiple beings, from a single mountain to multiple mountains. It is the Alborz, uh, that uh, mountain that gives birth to the other mountains after the earthquake. Despite this multiplication, these creatures remain all united and connected, forming a kind of shield against evil. So according to this beautiful account, the first creatures uh, try to stop the earthquake, 
But in reality, of course, earthquakes are still very real. And uh, this has given rise to another uh, discourse in Middle Persian texts in which the authors try to rationalize the existence of this uh, calamity because um, compared to other natural disaster, earthquakes uh, arrive without warning. They cannot be predicted, so they have to be explained. And their invisible trigger has always been an object of imagination and speculation. The Middle Persian language has a specific term to for uh, for earthquake, chandish na vizendag bun chandag, uh, derived uh, from an Indo-European root to tremble. This root is uh, specialized to express this phenomenon, while other type of trembling and shivering, uh, generated, for example, by fever or by fear are expressed using another verbal root. This linguistic distinction shows that earthquakes have a special status in Zoroastrian thought. So it's hardly surprising that the pandemonium of Zoroastrianism includes uh, an earthquake demon. Unfortunately, we don't know much about him. We know his name, uh, Chishmag or Chashmag. I'm not sure about the, the first vowel. We know that he's uh, uh, also responsible for uh, tornadoes, not only earthquake, but also tornadoes. He works uh, with a troop of 150 de other demons. He shows a certain tendency towards demultiplication and physical transformation. And this demon is the opponent of the earth uh, goddess, uh, Spandarmat. So this is what we basically what we know about him. And I don't know if he looked like this uh, dragon that you have on the slide, but um, he must have been much feared um, since he features in the story of, Zoras, of Zarathustra's birth. And he is uh, the only, de according to this story, he is the only demon to answer Ahriman's call to prevent the prophet's birth. And he causes earthquakes to destroy the house where Zarathustra is to be born. Chishmag, uh, Chishmag's destructive power were, was certainly a constant source of anguish and anxiety for the Zoroastrians who turned to their Magi for explanation. This priest um, uh, probably tried to rationalize the phenomenon of earthquake so as to be able to demonstrate tangible reasons beyond the supernatural to their faithful audience who asked them for the cause of this calamity. This is precisely the case of Manuchir and his community. Manuchir was the head of the Zoroastrian community of Fars and Kerman, the regions under his jurisdiction corresponds precisely to territories highly prone to seismic activities. And it is no coincidence that the faithful are clearly asking him about the nature, the cyclicity, the locality of the phenomenon, proof that this question emanates for the, from the genuine concern and fear of these people and not simply from their curiosity. This may include the fact that they felt safer and less affected by earthquake outside mountainous area. This is the, the, the first sentence that is highlighted. Um, they are asking from Manuchir if earthquake appears in the mountains or also in other areas. So uh, this um, indicates that the myth of the original earthquake that created the mountains that I mentioned earlier was still very much alive in the imagination of the inhabitants of this region. So they connected mountainous region with earthquake naturally. I would like to uh, comment very briefly Manuchir's uh, response to, uh, to his community. Because to my knowledge, these chapters of his Dadestani Denik has never been commented before. 
Manuchir provides a careful structure, carefully structured response. He doesn't simply retort that this mysterious and destructive phenomenon is the work of a demon or, of, or, or Ahriman. No, he develops a, a simple but very convincing argument. He first refers to the sacred text of the Avesta on cosmogony, then to a myth about earthquake, uh, which every Zoroastrian must have known in, in his time, um, a myth involving a particularly evil figure, Frasyab in Avestan Frangrasyam or in Persian Afrasyab, who is um, presented as a Ktonian, an underworld anti-hero in the sacred book. This anti-hero not only causes earthquake to destroy the dwelling of Iranians, but he also dries up springs and blocks access to water. Uh, he is what we might call a, a blocking, blocking figure. This character is also rooted in a geographical context. He is associated uh, in our Middle Persian text to the region of Ram Peroz, according to a Sasanian toponymy, which can actually be the same region as Ray. Uh, it is thanks to historians like uh, Tabari or um, Al-Dinawari that we can identify, identify the city founded by the uh, king, the Sasanian king Peroz in the, five, in the fifth century with the city of Rai, which as we have seen was the epicenter of several particularly deadly earthquake. So this piece of information is very valuable for historians of Iran because now we have proof that the region of Ray was linked to a myth about Afrasiab and earthquakes. Um, uh, finally, in the second part of his argument, Manucher invokes rational causes for earthquakes, describing the mechanism of earthquake uh, occurrence as based on the continuous movement of the wind beneath Earth's surface. There are two sine qua non conditions for an earthquake to be to, to happen. First, the obstruction of telluric passages. If the cracks in the earth core are obstructed, the underground wind, which is constantly in motion, cannot escape. It pushes against the walls of the passages, which is what causes the tremor and the quakes. The second condition is that these underground winds must be very violent, fast moving, backflowing, as explained to us Manu Cher, and it, uh, these uh, winds uh, must create a pressure on the earth which begins to tremble and crack. So this is a purely uh, mechanical and rational explanation that Manu Cher uh, provides, and he calls it uh, a major cause, a major reason. This is highlighted in green. So in, in this uh, two paragraphs, we immediately recognize the Aristotelian tradition of telluric pneuma. The Aristot Aristotelian theory of the vital breath or underground wind is so widespread that it's hardly surprising to find it in a writing of late antique Iranian Magi. It has been a reference point for over two millennia and persist in the present day to the present day in Iran folklore, as in many other traditions. While Manuchir is very cautious to distinguish between magical, uh, mythologic, mythological origin and natural causes of earthquake, one of his contemporaries, the author of the cosmogonic treatise that I mentioned earlier, the Bundahishna, he happily mixes Zoroastrian beliefs with Aristotle theory. Uh, from the latter, that is the Aristotelian theory, he borrows the theory of earth 
dual exhalation. So it's not the wind, but exhalation. One being hot and humid, and humid, this is the good wind, and the other being cold and dry, and that is the bad wind, which collide in the earth core. The author of the Bundahish mentioned uh, the earthquake uh, demon that we have met earlier, Chashmag or Chishmag. Um, and uh, this demon plays uh, the role of blocking figure, as you can see in this paragraph. This demon must perform a sorcery ritual, Jadug Deni, a sorcery ritual, to block the vital wind and causes and cause the telluric zone over which he holds sway to tremble. I um, would like to point out a correction um, that I have introduced into the text, which considerably modifies the interpretation of the passage. My uh, predecessors uh, have understood the passage di differently, uh, something like uh, the wind that preserves life, uh, the life preserving wind, but this does not make uh, a very good sense. And I think it's actually the Chashmak demon, the earthquake demon that hold, holds back, that blocks the passage of the wind. In this sentence, dashtar or the verb dashtan means, uh, doesn't mean to preserve, but to hold back and to retain. So now we have a, a, a sentence that makes sense. The, the Cheshmagon demons, the demons affiliated with the Cheshmag, are the one who blocks, are the ones who block the passage of the vital wind beneath the earth. So these Zoroastrian beliefs about earthquakes also tell us something about the psychology of ritual and the confrontation between immobility and movement. As far as earthquakes are uh, concerned, the collective action of demon's troop is the result of a ritual that would be the antithesis of Zoroastrian ritual, since it is qualified as Jadugi or Jadugdeni, sorcery. Whereas the Zoroastrian rite is essentially based on the fluidity and mobility of gift and counter gift, and that of elements as water prior uh, prayers and, and fire, a demonic ritual had to be imagined as causing a paralysis and immobilization of the natural elements. Demons' right would have the effect of blocking the passage of winds circulating underground and thus increasing the pressure under which the earth shakes and cracks. This explanation presented in the treatise of the Bundahish has the advantage of articulating a mechanism inspired in part by Aristotle theory to the demonological beliefs of Zoroastrianism. Um, as you uh, may uh, recall, um, Manuche um, has avoided making this combination. He simply juxtaposes or separates the two doctrines. One is religion, the other is rational, but he doesn't combine the two with each other. And this seems to me very um, consistent with his reputation of a very orthodox, rigorous priest with little, little inclination towards religious reform. There is another point of divergence, divergence between him and the author of the Bundahishna. Manuchir rightly assert that earthquakes occur in both mountainous and flat areas, whereas the Bundahish reserved them for the mountainous regions. This discrepancy, however ins insignificant, shows that Middle Persian texts are not united in the doctrines and schools of thought from which they originate. I uh, would like to uh, conclude um, with two elements from medieval Iran, but related to Zoroastrianism. Uh, the first is the crack in the wall of the Ktesiphon palace, 
um, that has uh, that is the origin of a legend that most of Iranian Iranians know. Uh, when the Prophet Muhammad was born in 570, the Zoroastrian fire temples were extinguished extinguished at once. And the earth shook under the palace of Khosro II, and this crack appeared in the wall. This was interpreted as a very bad omen, a prophecy foretelling the end of the Sasanian Empire, which indeed uh, occurred 80 years later, and the end of the Zoroastrian religion as the state religion. Um, the Zoroastrians have um, remained very committed to their rise, which have been the basis of their religious identity for more than three millennia. And one of their traditions symbolically protects them from earthquake. As you know, all Zoroastrian villages in Iran can be easily recognized by the presence of a tall, slender cypress tree. By planting cypress tree, they, uh, the Zoroastrian of Iran reproduce ad infinitum the image of the Kashmar cypress, cypress, the Kashmar cypress that was planted by Zarathustra um, in the region of uh, Khorasan in the Kashmar, in the front of Kashmar's fire temple, and the cypress was brought to him by uh, from the paradise. And um, um, if you uh, remember the, the seismic map I showed you earlier with the city of Neishabur, uh, Kashmar is very close to Neishabur. According to the geographer Hamdullah Mostofi in the 14th century, in his Nushat al Qulub, um, a geographical treatise of the 14th century, the Kashmar region was protected from earthquake as long as this cypress tree was alive. Walking through the deserts of the Yazd region, you can still see these slender cypress trees punctuating the landscape as, um, as uh, a uh, reminder that they still protect mankind from the demons of earthquake. I thank you for your attention. And I will be very happy to answer to your question um, if you have any. Thank you very much, Sambra Azarnoush. That's amazing. That's very interesting lecture. And I'm sure it will open a lot of questions in the audience, a lot of possible comments. So please, if anyone would like to ask any question, you can just write it on the, in the chat box or in the meanwhile, you can also unmute yourself. And I will give you the floor. Any question? Dr. Karishma, please. Thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you, Professor Tavakhali Tagir. Thank you so much, Miguel and Andreas Toledo. Professor Samara, you brought together some of the texts so beautifully with an understanding of the creation story. Thank you. A question regarding the importance of understanding earthquakes and natural disasters in the perfection of the idea of perfecting the world comes to my mind. Because you said two very interesting things that I wasn't aware of, that the texts say that the mountains are linked under the surface of the earth. Now, we yeah. know that water bodies are linked under the surface, and that's why the end of uh, Yasna ceremony, the water is poured back into the well because it is shared under the subterranean water source. <laughs> and you also said very interestingly that at the end of time, the mountains will become flat again. So they have come up at the beginning of creation and they will go back down. So I just wanted to understand from your perspective, as you understand natural disasters, what is their role in the aspect of this, this cycle of life, perfecting the world, um, removing evil, at a more sort of cosmological sense? 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment and, and this interesting question. Um, my feeling is that uh, um, according to the narration of the creation of the world, of course, this disaster that happened at the beginning of the time has an important role in the way they will shape the world in for later time. So um, the um, primordial earthquake that I described earlier at the beginning of my talk is a really important, it, it is a negative element because it's create is an evil creation, but it has a very positive role in the uh, process of the cosmogonic narration. And um, because as I said, uh, most of this um, cosmological narration is based on uh, on two movements. The one is destruction, the other is reconstruction. So it is, you know, for, uh, it is a natural way to put things in a co coherent way according to this discourse. And um, uh, what is very uh, important is that it um, it is, as I said, a negative phenomenon, but it will eventually generate the multiplication of creatures. And it's all, it's, I, of course, mentioned the, the example of mountains, but it also applies to other creatures, uh, other creatures in a very coherent way. So it is a very rational and, and uh, well-written narration because it's very coherent. You have the same skill, the same scheme that will apply to each uh, each of the creatures. And um, well, uh, I'm not sure for the for the water uh, because for for the water, the the connection uh, from one um, unite um, one single river to the all the waters of the earth is very uh, easy to see for us. But for the mountains, it has to be underground. And that's why the author of the Bundahish brings the example of trees to help the reader visualize the mountains, not only as living beings, but as living beings having roots uh, beneath the earth that are connected together. And uh, it's only one single passage, but I think it's rather clear that um, for Zoroastrians of uh, late antiquity and middle age, the mountains are forming a, a network. Uh, underneath the earth to protect from from other earthquakes for from other intrusion of evil and as a matter of fact there will be no more intrusion because uh, when evil comes to the world of Ormaz it is uh, trapped in it it is like a prison for him and he will not be able to escape until the end of time so the shield that is um, composed by the multiplication of the creature actually works very well, according to this narrative discourse of the creation. Beautiful, um, thank you. Carry on, please, yes. No, that's all, it's just ideas. Um, thank you for your question. It was thank really you. inspiring. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> thank you very much. We have another question by Barakatullah Ashuro. He said, we know that Zoroastrian life was ritualized and there are rituals directed at devotion, commemoration and festivals, including rituals again against hostile forces. Have you uncovered any ritual text that inform us about rituals observed on occasion or after the earthquakes? Um, I don't know. Um, I have to, well, this is a work in progress. Uh, I'm not. I'm not pretending to know everything about earthquake uh, traditions in Iranian world. It was only a try to, you know, to to make a sense out of out of these two texts and also to explore the origin of the mythological or or uh, more I don't know Greek uh, origins of some of the doctrines. So, uh, if you have an answer to this question, or if some of you knows about uh, a ritual for um, perverting from earthquake, I will be happy to know about. Maybe I, uh, we have to look for some indication, maybe in Pazan texts that are, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, give uh, indication about everyday life and ritual and, and private ritual. Um, um, 
I don't know actually. If someone knows the answer, I will be very happy to to learn from him or her. Mohammad, please, Mohammad Wakuli. Professor Azanush, thank you for your really inspiring uh, presentation. I am working on the interconnection of the cosmos and body and human body. And I am wondering, uh, since the, the concept of uh, Chandish is related to the concept that is very prevalent in Persian today, Chandish, which is bodily shake. Yes, that's the same word. Yeah. yeah. Have you found any connection between uh, this tremoring of the earth and body tremors, human body shake? Well, uh, not linguistically, because as I said, um, words for expressing the body shivering and tremoring are different from a different root. Uh, Chandish is could also mean a general is also a general sense for, for any kind of movement. But mm -hmm. when it applies to Earth, of course, it means only earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a connection in Middle Persian text, uh, and, and especially in the Bundahesh, uh, between um, cosmic or, uh, let's say, the, the mechanism in, inside the Earth uh, and the movement of, of winds beneath the Earth are compared to the movement of fluids and winds within the body. So this uh, macrocosmic, microcosmic uh, scheme also applies for this Zoroastrian text as well. Yes, it corrects. And it, it also come from, comes from Aristotle theory because Aristotle has also the same thing. When, exactly when he mentioned in, in metrology, me, uh, meteorology, when he mentions uh, the, the earthquake and, and the, the connection to the, to the body. Yeah, so it... Um, I uh, I don't know of any other text than the Bundahish, but I it, it is very pertinent that it's it's the case in our in our tradition in our Zoroastrian tradition as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question, Natalie Ganti? Yes, thank you. I I wondered if uh, there is more to say about the body of thought that this one priest you cited for bringing in the Aristotelian ideas and combining that with the mythological ideas. Did he think this way on other topics? Uh, and uh, did he turn to uh, not just Aristotelian, but generally rational, rationalizing uh, the mythology, do you know? Do you know any more on that about what he thought more broadly? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, actually, this chapter of Manuchir on earthquake is very short, uh, but it was included in the in the corpus of questions that was uh, submitted to him by his uh, uh, community. So it, uh, for me, it's very clear that it was an important topic. It was important enough to be included in, in, the, in the book in what was to become a book later, a collection of questions. Um, uh, this chapter is rather short um, and they, uh, what was really important and interesting for me is that um, the way he, uh, um, he composes the argumentation to answer the commu community. Uh, he, 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 he is very careful about the way he will present the phenomenon of earthquake to, the, to his faithful. First, he will refer to what they know uh, the best, that is religious, mythology, uh, evil character, like this uh, uh, Fra Siab who, is the one who will create create this calamity, and so the first, the for, more important thing for him is the the Abistan tradition that he brings forth at at the at the beginning of his answer. Then he will he will not combine it with a rational or um, a more technical explanation. He ends the sentence and then he he says. Well, there is a real reason, a major reason for this, 
And then he goes and explains the theory of the wind and um, the obstruction. The wind has to be blocked to uh, to and, and to create a pressure on the surface of the earth. And and well, he he, he gave a very uh, clear description of a mechanism inside the earth to help his uh, community or his, his um, the person who is asking the question to uh, visualize what is happening in the invis invisible part of the earth that creates the, creates the earthquake. So what was interesting for me is that he doesn't combine the two explanation together. He, sees, he, he doesn't put the rationality and the mythology together. He's really... Uh, uh, careful about this and of course he doesn't quote Aristotle huh he uh, I'm not sure that he knows it is Aristotle or not and it, this is not important because uh, his explanation is uh, actually not very uh, precise it's not very close to the Aristotelian text and uh, because he he just give a rather uh, a very sum a summary of of the mechanism of a very simple mechanism to explain the phenomenon to uh, to the um, to his audience, but uh, my article will be published in June. Uh, not only my article, but the whole papers that were presented as this uh, charity day I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, and uh, the um, all the proceedings will be published in uh, Revue de l'Histoire des Religions, and it will be, it will be online. So um, maybe you can find a a more complete answer in the published version. Thank you. Thank you very much. We very much look forward for that publication. <laughs> in the meanwhile, two more questions. And if you don't mind, the two last ones, in order not to overwhelm <laughs> the audience and of course, Sandra as a participant. So first, Manek Buchvala. Yeah, thank you, a very nice presentation. Uh, we learned a lot. I was uh, wondering, you, I, did I hear you correctly to mention that the heritage site of Balm has been reconstructed to its original state? Oh, that's a very good thing. And the other question was, or comment was that, you know, the prediction that when Muhammad was born, that uh, all the fire temples would be extinguished. But is that in historically, did all the fire temples get extinguished? I thought that some of them survived or something and they were later discovered by archaeologists or something thank you so much for your questions yes the actually i had the chance to visit the citadel of bam before the earthquake and um i remember that the um the the center part that was the residence of the governor was in a very good shape and the rest of the city uh, let me find a, the picture, uh, was actually in ruin. And I guess uh, when they reconstruct the site after the earthquake, they couldn't uh, build again the whole city because it's huge. It's several hectares. So they concentrate their efforts on the main citadel that you see on the on the horizon and, um, uh, and on also the, um, the walls. Uh, but I guess the, the lower part of the city and the houses are still in the in the shape that you can see on the on the screen. I'm I'm not sure actually. And about the second question, well, it is a legend, uh, yeah. so <laughs> right. it, of course it is not true that all the fire temple ex extinguishes, uh, and um, and also the crack has nothing to do with uh, with the prophecy, right? <laughs> It's only a story, and actually, I've I've um, I've uh, I've read it in one or two uh, chronicles of the city of Yaz, but I have to look for the older um, mention of this legend. Um, I have to still to work on this. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. And the last question by Asia Rafi, please. Yeah, good evening. Thank you very much, Professor Sambra, for a very interesting subject. I just, I'm just curious if, if it's not a sort of digression, how would be the interpretation of the um, uh, Zoroastrian uh, religion for the natural disasters like earthquake? It could be that in the battle 
between uh, Angra Minu and Agura Mazda. When, when happens uh, earthquake, it means in that battle, Angra Minu uh, won. Is there any interpretation for this kind of natural disasters? Thank you. That is a very interesting question. Uh, no, eventually Ariman will not uh, win. Uh, but uh, as far as I can say, all the natural disaster like flood and other are creation of uh, different demons. Uh, and uh, so the about earthquake, as far as I can say, it um, I think one of the texts mentioned that when the Zoroastrian try to behave according to the rituals and according to religious law, they um, limit the power of the um, earthquake demon. So it is a way to uh, push people to behave uh, in a more religious way. And so they will less be uh, victims of earthquake. Um, and um, I, I know that uh, uh, the explanation for the flood, for the rains, for uh, tornado and so on are not as complicated or as importantly put uh, than the earthquake. That's why I tried to work on this subject uh, because I the difference between the earthquake and other disaster is that, as I said, that the is totally invisible. Uh, so um, and this could not be predicted, and uh, contrary to other um, climate climate disaster. So it has a very special value in the Zoroastrian thought. And I think that was important to, to, to present for the first time. And I know that in Toronto, uh, you are not uh, hopefully uh, very, uh, I'm not sure it happens very much. Do you, do you know? Do you, I think that in Vancouver, yes, but not in Toronto. So you are lucky not to know, not to have felt this uh, very strange sensation when the when you feel that the earth beneath you is going to to crumble. So, but uh, for those of you who has this experience of earthquake, you you need to find for yourself a good reason, religious or not, to explain what is happening to you. Indeed, it is really <laughs> shaking in all senses. So. Thank you very much, Professor Azarnush. It was a great pleasure to have you thank in you. our thank series. That was my thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much. Also, thank you to all the audience for being here and for supporting our lectures. And I pass the turn to Professor Tavakoli Tarki. Um, thank you, Professor Azarnush, for your uh, inspiring, really original presentation. And I'm glad, I'm hoping that a whole lot of our colleagues will take the clues from you and, and expand and uh, look into uh, various other texts mm -hmm. on this topic. Uh, it has been already very informative for me uh, on, on the relationship of micro and macro. Um, mm -hmm. I also like to uh, thank Dr. Miguel Angel Andres Toledo for moderating the session and also Professor Enrico Raffaelli for helping to organize this uh, session and seminar uh, series. I uh, am also grateful to all of our uh, colleagues who have joined us today and I wish you a very happy day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you very much.